Hey, g'day, it's Preza. Thanks for joining me today. Now, you'll notice I've got a new sticker on the door today. This has come all the way from New Zealand, and the channel that the sticker belongs to is called Machine NZ. Now, the owner of the channel is Kevin, and if you watch his videos, you might get a bit confused about his accent. He was originally from the UK, but moved to New Zealand after having a holiday there and absolutely loved it. Now, I must say, I have a lot of respect for New Zealanders. Uh, I love the place. My father was a Kiwi. He moved here in his early 20s. And now, through his circumstances, my son lives and works in Wellington, which is where my father was born. So it's strange how things turn out. Now, if you check out Kevin's channel, you'll find that he does a lot of interesting model engineering and general engineering. He's just finished up a video series on a beautiful Kurzel hit and miss engine. And he has uh, fully documented the build of that little engine. And it's well worth having a look at. So what's today's video about? Well, this is part two of building some DIY path lights. Now these replace some very, very badly made solar path lights that I purchased. And I wasn't happy with the build and I decided to go ahead and actually make my own. Now in the last episode, I documented the materials that I'd chosen to make these lights from. We had a look at the beginning of the fabrication process for the path light bodies. And in this episode, I'm gonna go a bit further and finish that fabrication and we're going to make the composite plastic base that holds the electrics for the lights and we're going to make the plastic stakes that hold the lights in the ground. So lots to do, so uh, let's not stand around talking, let's get busy. Now I've got to be able to make 120 of these little tiny rivets. So these are made of 1.6 millimeter TIG filler wire, aluminium, and they've got to have a countersunk head on one end and then it'll fit through the, the two pieces of the assembly and it riveted over on the other side. Now I've just been timing myself and I can do about two of these a minute, maybe, yeah, maybe one in 40 seconds. So I'm just gonna have to stick at it and just try and get 120 done or thereabouts. Now the method I've used to make these little rivets is to make a die block out of some cold rolled steel and these two halves were gripped together in a drill vise and drilled down 1 16th of an inch diameter and the top was countersunk, not much, just enough to make a head for the rivet and the depth of the drill hole is the length that I need for each rivet and you could use this method to make rivets out of any soft material, so brass, copper, aluminium and it makes a serviceable sort of head on the rivet that, that works in the application I'm using it for so let me show you the, the workflow for doing the rivets. Now, I've been out this for about half an hour now, and that's how many I've got. But it reminds me of when I was going to college. Uh, I had a holiday job, and I used to go and work in a factory. Now, the factory made fishing reels. This was the Alvey Fishing Reel Factory in St. Lucia in Brisbane. And this one particular holiday, they put me down to the factory floor, and I was operating a machine that made little tiny hair springs. They were probably only about uh, 18 millimeters long, and they were made of a very fine wire. And uh, the machine had a series of hand-operated levers that bent the wire around a series of mandrels and then finally cut it off to length. And as you finish each spring, you'd throw it into a plastic container. And the job was so boring that to keep from going insane, I would play this game where I'd try to completely fill the bottom of the container. That was the goal. And the first time I was doing this, I was watching as I was filling this container, 
almost got it covered, the bottom of the container, and some worker came along and emptied it into another bucket and took it away. So um, yeah, the, it was a bit soul destroying and uh, it certainly made me appreciate education and uh, why you should go to college and try to get a job that's a little bit more challenging than making repetitive parts in a factory, but it was, it was a good learning experience for me anyway. Anyway, I've got to keep at it. Let me show you how I'm going to drill the holes in each one of these bars for the rivets. So what I've got is a piece of that eco deck composite decking just because it was convenient and would take a thread and I've got a piece of wood with some saw cuts in it that align those three bars and keep them in alignment and we're going to clamp the whole lot together with a couple of screws now none of this has to be really tight it's just to stop things moving around while we drill and we want that block of wood more or less central in the aperture. And we're just going to tighten that up a bit. All right, so that's all held firmly now. And we're going to drill a single 1 16th diameter hole in each one of these metal bars here and right through into the square stock underneath. So let's go over the CNC mill and get this set up. Now the G-code that I'm running here to drill each of the six holes for the rivets is a very simple point-to-point -point drilling operation. And the G-code just simply positions the drill bit over each of the six positions and then I'm lowering the quill by hand. Now a lot of you are probably saying, gee, you know, what a chicken. What's the matter? Chicken? Uh, you should at least be using a peck drilling operation or a can cycle or something like that. And I must say, I'm insulted, and I've only got one thing to say about that, and that's And the reason I say that is I've already broken one drill bit doing this on another job. Far out. Okay folks, that's why you should use coolant. <laughs> so now I've got a brand new drill bit, and this time I'm going to use some coolant or lubricant and we'll do the job properly and carefully. So that's how I'm holding the, the bars down, keeping everything clamped together, pretty straightforward. And these need to be countersunk top and bottom. Now to do the tops, I'm just using one of these Noga countersink tools, and it just needs two very light spins to give me enough countersink for the rivet to hold. So the deeper you do these countersinks, the more metal you have to actually force down into the material. and it just becomes a little bit more difficult that's all I'm doing there now to do the other side of course you can't get a tool in there uh, like a, a tool driven by a drill or anything like that so I figured that the easiest way to do this is with a Dremel and I can get in there on an angle and do it. So I'll just show you what I mean. So all I'm using here is a very small carbide uh, burr with a ball end on it. And I can get in there on an angle and just put that into each one of those drilled holes. And once again, you don't need much. It's just enough to make a depression for the head of the rivet. Now, the, the trick with this though is that as you lower it into the hole, it has a tendency to skip sideways and make a mess. In reality, it doesn't matter. Nobody's going to see it. Uh, the, the trick though is as you put it in, you've got to sort of pull uh, in the opposite direction to the way it wants to run and just drop that into each hole. So I'll try and do this. The camera's sort of in the way, but uh, see how we go.
So that's it, that's all you need. And then the rivet heads will sit into those little countersinks or depressions. So when you push down, each of the rivets will pop through there now. And we need to draw the rivet up. So even though the stem of the rivet is popped through there, if you have a look on the other side, the heads aren't really uh, in the depressions that we made with the Dremel. So that's the next step. So this little tool is really just a drilled hole, the same diameter as the rivet. And it goes over the stem of the rivet and then when you tap down with a hammer, it actually pulls the rivet up into the countersink underneath there. And as you do that, you'll hear a change in the note. And you'll sort of feel. And you'll feel that the rivet is properly bedded in the countersink underneath there. And this just puts everything into a nice contact. Here that sounds quite different now. And the next step is to cut the rivet off so that we've got the correct amount to go down into the countersink. So I'm just using a small washer and a pair of flush cutters. And you sort of have to experiment with the amount of material that you've got protruding there to hammer down into the countersink. Now if these were a domed head rivet, you'd use a special tool now with the correct hemispherical uh, recess in the bottom of it. But for a countersunk rivet, you just tap it down into the hole. Now the correct way to do this is to use the ball end of the ball pan hammer and go around the edge of that rivet. But uh, in reality, my eyes aren't good enough to do that. <laughs> and you've got to be a little bit careful not to overdo it because if you really hammer hard, you're going to distort the material at the edges of the countersink. In fact, that one there, I can already feel it's distorted a little bit. It'll need a, a bit of dressing with the file. But essentially, that's it. That's you know, more or less permanently attach those bars there now certainly way stronger than they need to be and I can draw a file off the face of that uh, that stem and bring it down flush with the top of that bar there so to finish off now I'm just going to file the inside So it needs to be nice and flush in there so when we put the glass in it won't catch on the rivet heads. Now you can see just a little edge around the countersink there where I've draw filed and, and polished that with some memory but trust me you won't see it <laughs> when it's powder coated. Um, you're going to use a textured powder coat it'll easily hide whatever you can see of that rivet there now. But yeah that's done so just rinse and repeat now and get them all done.
Well, here we are back on the CNC mill. Now, what I need to do is to make a part that fits inside this uh, light housing, and it will uh, not only carry the, the light fitting, or the, the terminals for the light fitting, but it also attaches to the stake, which keeps the light anchored in the ground. Now, the material that I choose for doing this needs to be something that's uh, weather resistant, but also it needs to be a good insulator. I wouldn't feel comfortable at using metal on this part of the, the light, even though it's only 12 volts AC. Uh, you don't really want any opportunity for uh, the power to short out in any way. So the material I've chosen to use this stuff here, it's called Eco Deck. Now this is an example of one of those composite decking materials. There are lots of them on the market at the moment, but they're usually a mixture of uh, plastic and also some sort of organic material. Now in this case, with this particular brand, the organic material is rice hulls. And in some of these decking materials, they use wood flour or wood dust or wood particles. But that's what they've used here is rice hulls. Here's one that's already been machined on one side. This is the operation I do next. And you can see those little, uh, oh, what are they like, flakes of organic material and they help to stabilize plastic and increase its strength and uh, bulk out the amount of plastic that's required to make the, the boards themselves. Now, the only reason I'm using this is I just happen to have some that's off cuts from a job that I did, but it does machine really well. Now, I'm using the CNC because I want these to be totally accurate and uh, the cutters I've chosen to use here are these are wood router bits. Now it's a half inch uh, straight router bit for you know, you're normally working with wood. This is a chamfer bit and I've got a long series 3 16 three flute end mill. Now I need this one to be able to make the slots for the wires. So when this is um, assembled in the ground we need the wire to go up through this slot uh, through the terminal block and out the other side and the wire is that sort of elongated shape that you see there, it's not a round wire. And I want these holes to be a fairly tight fit on the wire so I don't get ants and insects you know, carrying stuff up inside the light. So that's the cutters that I'm using here. And the other thing is that um, all of these wood router bits have quarter inch shanks, as does this cutter here, which means that I don't have to keep changing out collets in the spindle. So there's quite a few tooling changes and it speeds up the whole process if you don't have to swap out the collets. The other thing of course is that these wood router bits are relatively cheap and they work really really well on this material, probably better than a, a metal uh, end mill or any sort of metal cutting tool. So um, I'm going to set this one up now, we'll run all the operations to do this side and then the whole thing has to be turned over and mounted on a, on a, uh, like a stud and then we can do the operations on the other side to make sure everything is concentric. Alrighty, let's go. Okay, this uh, first tool path is going to surface the uh, top of this material here. It will machine the pocket for the top of the stake and it will also profile the outside of the stock which is currently oversized. So half inch wood router bit uh, we're running at about uh, 1500 RPM and we can be fairly aggressive with the depth of cut and the, the feed speeds here.
All right, you can see there's a little bit of a burr there around the edge, but that's going to be chamfered off later. So I'm going to swap over now to that 3 16 uh, end mill, and we're going to cut the pockets to the wire and drill a central hole. Right, we'll change out now for the chamfering tool. We'll just do that outer edge. So there's our part and this needs to be flipped over now. I've got some sheeny to do on this side. But the finish on this stuff is beautiful. So um, yeah, just got I think what seven more to go. Now I got a bit lazy when I set up to do this second operation. So this is cleaning out the top of this block and taking a cut around the perimeter so that it will fit inside the aluminium tubing and also have clearance for the glass. So the orientation is really important here. I've got to have these slots uh, front and back in the Y direction. And I'm just using a straight edge to set the stock against the edge of the vise. Now, the original plan was to set this on some sort of a spigot. So you can see underneath here where that pocket is. I was going to set that on a spigot and screw it down from the top. But that would have meant that I couldn't deck the top of this stock. Now some of this has got a bit of damage on it that I want to remove. So in the end I've just uh, used my probe and I've offset from the edge of this jaw and the back of the vise half the dimension, half the actual square size of the stock in the vise and then I put a 3 16 pin in the collet chuck and lowered it into that hole and it was spot on. So I'm confident I've got that right. <coughs> So I'll go ahead and clean this up now, and that's the last operation on this part. Oh, I didn't quite clean up that damage there, but that doesn't matter. It's all going to be inside the, the light anyway. So these will need a bit of just trimming up on the outside there, but they're pretty much done.
Now this is how that assembly goes. So the uh, the turned end on the peg will fit into that circular hole in the bottom of this eco deck plate here. Terminal block will sit on top of that, and there'll be a single stainless steel self-tapping screw that will hold everything else together. So I'm using stainless steel as I don't want it to corrode. And the next step is to cut the point on the end of the stake here. Now this was uh, drawn as a conical end turned on the lathe but that's a, a long slow process and I thought I'll just cut these on a circular saw make a four sided pyramid end on this and then I realised that this uh, recycled plastic has actually got steel strands in it and I'm guessing they've used recycled tyre cases to do this and they just haven't bothered taking the steel out and I thought that might uh, be bad for my tungsten carbide tip circular saw blade which I keep exclusively for wood where I can so um, I think I'm going to have to go back to plan A and do these on the lathe. Very big chunk of something like some inclusion in there and you can also see that the center of the stake is very very porous but uh, this is going to have a fairly blunt point on it so I'm not too bothered but yeah there's all sorts of interesting stuff embedded in that uh, recycled plastic Well, for something that's going to be buried in the ground, that's fine. Okay, this is where we've got to. So here's a whole uh, sub-assembly, or pretty much all of it so far. And everything fits together with this, this one single screw here. Stay in the steel screw. Uh, and you can see the openings where the wire will come up from the ground, through the terminal block and the lamp, through the other opening and back down onto the next lamp. And when it's assembled, it looks like that. Now there's a single screw that will hold the, the light body to the base and on my drawing it shows that screw is right in the center of the tubing but I realized afterwards that the point of the screw would end up going through into the opening where the wire is which is probably a bad thing. So I've had to relocate that and there'll be a single screw at the top to hold the cap on as well. Now if you look inside you'll see that there is a gap uh, in the the, the bottom where of the front aperture and the same at the back aperture there and that gap is sized so that we can put a piece of four millimeter glass down inside and into that gap and that means that the glass is actually held in just by the assembly of the base and the cap so it doesn't need any other fixing to hold it in there and I am going to do some decorative work on that glass and uh, that'll be shown in a separate episode coming up soon now in the next episode we're going to do the castings for the caps and uh, that's going to be interesting, <laughs> always is. Um, that's certainly something that never ever goes to plan so uh, yeah, anything can happen so tune in for that. And uh, I think so far we're traveling along quite well with this. It's, uh, it's going to look really nice when it's done. I've ordered some very special powder coats for doing this so I can try a few different types and see what's going to work best but I think this is going to work really well in the garden. 
still hoping to do the announcement about the 15,000 subscriber thing, but uh, when the, the gifts turn up, I'll do that announcement separately as a separate video. But for now, it's Preso signing out. Uh, catch you on the next episode. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.